Hello again, we're continuing on with our application of dynamic aggregate supply and demand analysis. Now, as I mentioned, we can use this framework not just to understand the 1930s and the Great Depression, we can apply it to, um, to other episodes in the economy, and we'll, we'll take a, a quick look at a few more here. I want to look at the 1970s. The 1970s is uh, what happens in the U.S. economy is known as stagflation. In other words, we get economic stagnation in terms of low growth rates of real output plus inflation, plus high inflation. Well, that wasn't supposed to be possible in the Keynesian system. And let's briefly review why. Here's long-run output. Let's say our long-run output trend is still at 3%. Call this the solo curve. Here's short-run aggregate supply. Slopes upward due to that sticky wage effect. If you don't, if you're not familiar with this, go back and watch a previous lesson. And here's aggregate demand. At the beginning of the 1970s, here's that same chart. Okay, at the beginning of the 1970s, we have, okay, here's barring a recession year here, we've got something like 3% real growth, as I mentioned. We've got something like 4, 5% inflation. But notice, the inflation rate in, back in the 1960s and the 1960s have been much lower, 1.5%, 2%. And this builds up steeply in the late 1960s. We go from 1.5% inflation here in the mid-60s up to 5% inflation by the beginning of the 1970s. Okay, 5% inflation, 3% real growth, adds up to 8% nominal growth. Okay, so let's put this, let's put the experience of the 1970s in again in very simple terms into our dynamic aggregate demand supply model. Let's say, and the numbers aren't quite as neat here as they were for the Great Depression, but let's just say our average aggregate demand growth had been 6%. We actually had pretty strong uh, real growth, let's call it 4% going into the 1970s, and pretty mild inflation of 2%. Um, okay, so we're at this nice equilibrium, this mostly large growth, uh, low inflation equilibrium going into the 1970s. Okay, now the important thing to understand about short run aggregate supply is that the level of short run aggregate supply is based on what we call inflation expectations, and we'll label this pi e. Pi means inflation rate, and e for expectations of 2%. What starts to happen in the 1970s, as we saw, is the rate of inflation gets built up and up and up. Now, if there's something that knocks the economy temporarily off this long-run trend of 4% economic growth, well, what monetary policy will do or what economic policy will do is try to boost the growth rate back up by raising aggregate demand. And we'll talk in detail later on in Unit uh, 5 and 6 exactly how this can happen, but this happens mainly through the Federal Reserve trying to increase the money supply. Remember, this is M times V, total nominal spending. And let's say they raise it up to 9%. Okay, to try to boost the economy out of a temporary slump. Okay, what's going to happen is we're going to see a boost in inflation. We might see a temporary, we might see a little bit of a boost in output. Let's say output goes up to 5%. But we know inflation is going to have to go up to 4%. Okay, 4 plus 5 equals 9. Okay, Well, if inflation starts to creep up to higher levels, people are going to say, wait a minute. I was planning on 2% inflation, and now it's 4%. 4% minus the 2% I had planned for, leaving me affected by a 2% unexpected inflation, which is reducing the real purchasing power of my money. Now again, I've mentioned with money illusion, people tend not to notice inflation until it gets to really high levels. Well, this is exactly what we'll see in the 1970s. Look at these inflation rates go to 4, 5, 9%. Okay, the overall average for the 1970s inflation rate is going to be, is going to jump up to 8%. Inflation average of 8% for the 1970s. Okay. So what happens to short run aggregate supply? Well, people are obviously going to adjust upwards their expectations of the coming inflation rate so they can keep their um, real income stable, Okay, so they, can, so they won't get burned by inflation. And what we're going to see happen is as inflation heats up, 
we're going to see the shortened aggregate supply curve get shifted up as well. So we'll have shortened aggregate supply curve after maybe a year or two of 4% inflation. The shortened aggregate supply curve is going to go straight up to reflect people's expectation that the, the inflation regime is now a higher inflation regime. And even notice at the higher level of aggregate demand, well now we're going to be dealing with a new reality and let's say growth is down to three and inflation is actually up to six. Okay. What is government policy going to do? Let's take aggregate demand up again. This time let's say to 13 percent. That might bring us back here to our solo growth rate, temporarily at least, but notice it's only going to accomplish that with an inflation rate now of 9 percent. Okay, and this is what we'll actually see towards the end of the 1970s. And in the meantime, again, what are people going to do to their inflation expectations? In the meantime, their inflation expectations are going to be shifting, which means a short and aggregate supply curve is going to be shifted back again. It's going to be shifted up, I should say, again. And we're now going to wind up here with this constant tug of war between constantly rising inflation to maintain the higher levels of output and employment in the economy. And the end result of all this is, well, now you have an inflation problem. Okay, Inflation gets up into the double digit range, which it does. You'll notice here at the end of the 19... 70s into the early 1980s. Uh, consumer inflation actually peaks at 14%. This is overall inflation with the GDP deflator. Okay, it gets pretty high in and of itself. But what we have is consumer inflation way up here at 14%. And the short and aggregate supply curve just keeps shifting, shifting, shifting like this. And what we wind up with is actually lower growth rates and higher inflation rates as people build up these inflation expectations. Okay. To cure the inflation, we'll get into this in a lot more detail in the next unit, but just very briefly, to cure the inflation, what you have to do is really cause a negative aggregate demand shock because aggregate demand, again, is M times V, or specifically the growth rate of M plus the growth rate of V. And if inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, how do you stop inflation? You stop inflation by reducing the growth rate of M. And what that causes is a contraction in aggregate demand. And let me change this to a different color here. We're going to shift the aggregate demand curve back. But in the meantime, we've built up the short and aggregate supply curve like this. And if we have an aggregate demand curve that shifts way back like this, interacting with a short and aggregate supply curve that's way up here, what we're going to have now is a very low growth rate. Okay, we're going to go maybe to minus 3, minus 2, minus 3 percent growth. Okay, and that's the inflationary recession that we see in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Okay. That's what we're seeing right here by 1980-82. It's a double dip recession. Now we see minus 2 percent real growth bring inflation down, it starts to come down by 1982 to 6%, and there we go, 4% nominal spending growth. From look at these nominal spending growth rates we had in the late 70s, 12, 11, 9, 12%, that is a serious decline in the growth rate of nominal spending. Okay, In other words, that's a big negative aggregate demand shock once again. Okay? We can see that going on here, right here in this data. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind is uh, in the 1970s, we have these oil shocks happening. What kind of shocks are these? Well, it's a steep increase in the oil price. You can see it happens early in the 1970s, 73, 74. The oil price almost doubles, actually more than doubles, uh, right before this recession happens. And then again in the late 1970s with the Iranian Revolution and the Iran-Iraq War, oil price more than doubles again right here. And right, that happens right before a recession. The way to interpret oil shocks, because oil is a factor of production, are these aggregate demand or aggregate supply shocks? Well, that's a factor. These are that's a real factor. This is an aggregate supply shock, okay, or a real shock, a negative real shock, negative aggregate supply shock. We'll see that up here in terms of the model let's let's clean this up we could look at 
an oil shock up here in terms of now we're going to be shifting the solo curve in addition to the aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply curves. Let me set this up. Okay, so what we have going on in the 1970s is this gradual buildup of aggregate demand through over-expansionary monetary policy. And that's accompanied by higher inflation, which pushes the short run aggregate supply curve up like this. Let's go ahead and label these. One, two, three. One, two, three. And on top of all of that, we get these oil shocks. So now we're going to do solo curve one, solo curve two, solo curve three. Okay. And by the end of the 1970s, we go from down here, from a fairly, at the beginning of the 1970s, we go from a fairly low inflation, let's say 2% and 4% real growth, something like that, up here to a very high inflation, let's say 10%, and actually low growth, maybe something like zero. Okay, and AD might have started off at 6%, and it winds up at 10%. Okay, so we're building up aggregate demand all along, but that's causing inflation, and it's pushing up aggregate supply all along. And then we get hit with some real shocks, some oil shocks, and that pushes the solo curve to the left. So we start down here, and we end up here with high inflation, low to negative growth, and high unemployment, stagflation. Okay, so this framework... And I know I've gone through this pretty fast, but I just want to point out how this framework is so useful to understanding a lot of events. Okay, we'll see the 1970s is complex because we have real shocks and nominal shocks, aggregate demand, aggregate supply shocks, inflation shocks, what have you. This framework is very useful to understanding that. Here's the oil shocks. Here you can see the inflation shocks. Uh, this time I'm looking at the consumer price index. And you can see that I told you we had a peak 14% inflation rate. There's actually two inflation builds up. Notice at the beginning of the 1970s, inflation was high, but it came down. But then it builds up here. And here's our first oil shock. Inflation builds up to above 10% in 1974. It comes back down to about 5%, but then it builds right back up again. And it peaks out about 14% in 1980. Then we've slammed the brakes on monetary policy. We put the economy into a negative aggregate demand shock here. We get a double dip recession, and that squeezes the inflation out of the system. We'll talk about this in some more detail when we go into Unit 5 on monetary policy. But you want to be familiar with uh, how these things work out in terms of this dynamic aggregate supply and demand framework. Okay, finally, let me just touch on very briefly the Great Recession of the 2000s, again in terms of the same model. Okay, And we'll start off kind of by looking at the, the growth we saw in the late 90s. Remember that boom we saw with the high above trend growth up in the 4 or 5% range and the very low inflation. Inflation is in the 2% or lower range. And here we have total nominal spending growth in the 6% range. Okay. What happens in the boom in the 2000s, we've got this brief little recession. You don't actually, the growth rate doesn't even go negative. It just drops off. Um, in 2001, we're going to build our growth rate back up. Not that much, but it'll go back into the threes, three and a half percent. We're also going to build up some inflation. Inflation will get back up in the three percent plus range. Okay, so that means total nominal spending is in the range of about six right here in the mid 2000s. What's going on here is the housing boom. Okay, and the best way to think about the housing boom is something of a positive aggregate demand shock. Why? Well, it goes back to that concept of the wealth effects. Okay, we have got a positive aggregate demand shock right here in the mid 2000s, and you can clearly see this in the early 2000s. Aggregate demand is growing about three or four percent, and it goes up to growing at about six percent, six five percent through the mid 2000s. What's the aggregate demand shock? Well, take a look here at the total net worth from the balance sheet of households and nonprofit organizations. And take a guess as to what the biggest asset in the balance sheet of households is. Households. Hint, hint, hint. It's their value of their house. Okay, The house is the single biggest asset. 
for the typical American family. And what happens here in the mid-2000s is this massive buildup in household wealth from the housing boom. Look, it started at about $40 trillion in the early 2000s, and it gets built up to almost $70 trillion. Okay, that is a massive increase. The vast bulk of that is from housing values that are going up on paper during this housing boom, and they quickly crash back down in the housing bust, which, not surprisingly, happens right before this recession of 2008-2009. Okay, so this is a wealth effect. Here we see a positive aggregate demand shock in the lead-up to the boom. We've got a positive AD shock through that wealth effect channel. And in the bust here in the recession, we've got a negative AD shock. Okay. I hope we'll have time towards the end of the class where I want to look at the housing boom and bust and the recession of 09 uh, in, a, in some detail. So this just gives you a little teaser, a little sample of uh, how we can again put, kind of put this into this framework. Okay. Uh, finally, I wanted to show you this, the overall trend of gross domestic product, nominal GDP. Okay, notice this is not real. This is just nominal gross domestic product, total spending on final goods and services in the economy. We'll just call it total spending. Okay. I want to show you, and I'm going back here to 1980, and we can see all these big recessions. We had this double-dip recession we had in 80-82. Notice the trend of nominal GDP. It, it just kind of slows down here, but it doesn't actually decline. Okay. Then it builds nicely through the 80s. There's a little recession here in 91. Again, it doesn't really decline. It just levels off. But then in the 90s, we have good growth, and it's growing steadily, growing steadily. This really minor recession in 01, you see it really just slows down. It doesn't even, it doesn't even decline at all. And then it builds strongly in the housing boom of the 2000s. But look what happens. What happens in the recession of 09 is something we haven't really seen since the Great Depression, which is that total spending actually decreases for the first time in a long time. Okay, That right there in terms of the aggregate supply, aggregate demand framework. That is a huge negative aggregate demand shock. That's a huge negative AD shock. Okay, And that's why when Keynesians, Keynesian-oriented economists and commentators look at this, they say, oh my goodness, okay, this is an epic disaster waiting to happen. We need to call in the cavalry, so to speak to do something to repair this decline in aggregate demand. And that'll b bring us in when we get into Unit uh, 6 and fiscal policy. We'll talk about Keynesian policies, fiscal and monetary policies that, can, that are designed to try to avert this decline in spending. And if, you know, you'll notice if we could keep ourselves on this growth path right here, not only maybe would we have avoided the recession, but the overall growth in the economy would be much higher than it actually is. Okay, we call this right here the GDP gap. Okay, but we'll talk more about that. All right, so I think that uh, that covers our dynamic aggregate supply and demand framework adequately. You've probably uh, got a wealth of information. Hopefully you're not confused about it. I encourage you to kind of take this model to heart, dynamic aggregate demand and supply, a very useful framework, a very useful model, and um, you know, go back and kind of look at these numbers, look at the charts, look at the understand the way the graph works. And I think you'll do very well in applying this to understanding really all of our business cycles that we've experienced in the U.S. economy in the last, uh, actually the last 200 years. Okay, But that's not all. That This is not the final uh, word that we'll have to say on the cause of business cycles. What we'll do next is take a look at Austrian business cycle theorem. We'll take a look at, the, at Frederick Hayek's approach to understanding the business cycle, and he's going to have something a little different to say. And again, I think it's very important to pay attention to the Hayekian, the Austrian point of view, because, boy, when we look at this theory, we're going to see a lot of prospective applicability to the housing boom and the recession of 2009. So we'll, uh, we'll do one more lesson here on Austrian business cycle theory, and that'll wrap Unit 4. And then we'll be moving into uh, looking at monetary policy in some detail in Unit 5.